Welcome everybody. Uh, the first thing which I want to share with everybody that um, not in common with most of the people who talk about monetization, the good thing is I don't want any of your money because I don't have any platform, I don't have anything where I make money myself of. So I'm just trying to share you some of the cool things that, um, that I've seen on the market that I've uh, gotten from friends who said that's the best way to, to monetize apps on Android because that's uh, to be quite frank, an area where a lot of people lack. I mean, we all know that the volume on Android is amazing, but unfortunately people are making, in my opinion, too less money, and uh, yeah, we should all make more money. So that's a bit the intention to talk from developer to developer, um, that we can all make more money, that the platform is more attractive for all of us. Um, so just that you have a very brief intro, um, what, who, who I am and why, why I'm talking about the subject. So I am a CTO and a co-founder of a company called Scobbler, which has a very weak presence on Android as, now, as of now, uh, because we had issues with monetization. So actually we had an Android app which had approximately half a million customers, but we pulled the plug because we said we have to rework it in order to make money, and we're about to relaunch that in the next weeks. We have a small app life and we have a couple of other projects on Android Live which are not immediately visible about our brand, so we, we have more activities than is visible on the market. But nevertheless, we strongly believe in the platform. We have a team of, I think, now 15 people working full-time on Android. So we're, we're very committed to the platform. But our strong success comes definitely on the iOS side. We've sold more than 3 million apps on iOS. Last year on German market, we have been number two and number four app in the App Store market. Overall in Germany, and paid apps have been developed by us. So basically only WhatsApp beat us. Then there was our app, the GPS nav. Then there was Angry Birds. And then there was another from our apps. So we're, we're a profitable company making money on apps. So I think that's a bit the background what I'm talking um, and why I know that it's possible to b build a profitable company with 70 people based on apps and not like developing it for other, other people, but really charging the users, advertisers, whatever. So that's a bit the background. And I'm now sharing what we've learned over the last month on Android and what we believe uh, is the best ways to, to make money of that platform. So. I'll start a bit with the basics because a lot of people just jump in and go very deep into individual topics. I think the most important thing to figure out is that there's a couple of different screws which you can turn for monetizing better on Android. So um, the three key factors which I'm going to look at with the, with the 10 monetization hacks in this presentation is basically how you can increase the number of installs how you can increase the number of active users on a monthly, on a daily basis, whatever. So basically getting a better retention. And then the third thing is, of course, how I can make a better average revenue per user. Because it might depend on what stage your app has. If you have 1 million users already, but only 10,000 of them are active, then it will be very hard for you to increase the revenue per user if you don't get in a lot of new users. So I think it's like you have to see how you stand in the different areas of the installs, of the active users, and the revenue per user to see what's the right thing for you to, to, to deal with that. And I think you can only do a successful app when you're doing that. I think what I've looked at in this presentation, which I'll look at most, is at the gaming industry. Not because I'm talking really about monetization for gaming, because I think this is a whole different topic and there's really a lot of information about there, but because the gaming industry usually does this best. So I'll, I'll look at what's like best practices and try to share some of those, and then well, hopefully we can discuss and you can say, well, that's bullshit, we tried that, that never worked, or yeah, that's a good idea, or maybe some other ideas. So let's, uh, yeah, let's see what we can make out of that. So, I'll start with the with a, with a first an extremely simple hack because it just takes like half an hour to implement and can bring you quite a bit of money. So I think the first common misconception among most developers is that Android equals Google Play and that's clearly very, very wrong. So I think by a very, very simple fact, I mean what I can say is, as I said, we have now a small, small, smallish app on Android Live which we use mainly to test our technology. So to give you an idea, on all platforms we make like 5,000 euro revenue a month, which is like very tiny compared to what we do on the other platforms. But it's also not our full navigation app, it was mostly to test the technology and so on. And we have seen that we make more than half of the revenue on platforms which is not Google Play. 
So if you can submit it to the Amazon App Store, if you can go to Barnes and Noble, you can go to the Samsung App Store, you can go to Android Pit, you can go to Handango and so on. So that's like a very, very simple hack which like you can do in this afternoon and potentially increase your number of installs and your revenues. Maybe you have to do some adaptation later if you do in-app purchases and so on, so maybe it's more than this afternoon. But if you have a simple paid app or so on, you might be able to just like upload it, have it work, and that's it. And for us, that's, uh, that's basically uh, the very simple way to just say, I mean, if you just have an Android app anyway, then it's just nonsense if you don't submit it to the other markets. And we get small, but still we get checks for like virtually no effort from the other platforms. So definitely the uh, issue is if you, if you just like not consider the other markets, it's just like a waste of your time and effort that went into that. Well, the second trick which, uh, which I'll address, this is the, the screenshot in back which you can see is from an iOS app, but of course it works in the same way, is embrace pirates. I mean, on Android there will be a lot of people who pirate your app, just deal with it. And I mean, I usually don't have a problem with that because I pirated so much software when I was young that I'll never go to sue any pirate. So from my perspective, it's, yeah, well, yin and yang kind of thing that I'll get back for what I did when I was young. But at least, I mean, you can do something about it. And you can uh, implement things like notifying the pirates, maybe that it would be cool if they pay. And maybe you convert some of the pirates. I mean, I wouldn't do anything radical like uh, blocking the people from using your app because then they'll just crack it better and use it anyway and be angry at you. Um, so I think consider that pirates can be your friends and you can tell them nicely saying, okay, well, you're using my app pirated. I know that you're doing that. You're a bad boy. So maybe you pay me at least a bit, um, whatever. Or maybe you donate something. So consider that. I mean, it's very easy. You can go to the developer Android site. You can look at the licensing platform you can like check very easy if a user paid for your license or if he just like pirated your app or your in-app purchases or whatever so I mean just display them a message ask them kindly if they would maybe not in any way contribute uh, to your app so I think that's that's a very nice way to do it as you see in the background this is what what uh, on iOS the plat uh, uh, Twitter client called tweetbot did so they basically made anybody who pirated the app the first tweet which they were sent was I've been demoing a pirated copy of tweetbot and really like it so I'm going to buy a copy um, which is I think kind of funny thing because people still could use the app later on so they didn't block functionality because that's total nonsense I mean you'll never get the pirates away they just crack the app better um, and it's like a nice way to to deal with them and uh, yeah, just use something to, to, to incentivize them to maybe later uh, pay you. So then the next thing. Um, what I think is, is, is fairly important is the visual representation in the app stores. And uh, don't look at the big brands because they do it pretty shitty. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you can really understand what they're doing. I mean, on the right side in Mercedes, you see pretty much that I mean, you cannot, if, if you look at this distance on Mercedes on the right side, you have no clue. You see one image of a big car, which you would kind of expect from Mercedes that they're doing something about cars. But basically on first side, you have no idea what the app is about. So, I mean, this is, and you, and you see the apps are not fairly successful. I mean, a sixth app with 100,000 plus downloads and Mercedes app with 10,000 plus downloads. I mean, with the cost that Mercedes has for putting these apps with the agencies, probably they pay half a million for the app so they can just give everybody a 50 euro check and be cheaper than uh, having a crappy app which they don't represent nicely in the app store. So I would really much prefer that way. Um, so let's look at some games who, who do the visual representation much better. And there you can see, I mean, this is like, three of the top 10 grossing apps because at the end if you want to make money not the number of downloads matter but making money matters and there you can see a couple of very simple and very nice patterns so if you look at the if you look at the simpsons app what you see first of all they don't show you any headers or footers of the app they're knowing that they're on the phone right if you look at these screenshots they show you the android top bar plain waste of space. I mean, you're knowing that you're downloading an Android app. You don't expect really that this disappears anyway. So it's just pure waste of space. So they just really use the full amount of the content. Then the next very nice thing which you see is also they use landscape screenshots here. So you see that the, uh, the landscape screenshots are in the second case you see with the video, they just like allow you to use much more space than if you use upright screenshots um, in that way. Then the next thing is that don't have to limit yourself to app screenshots. Nobody says that you have to put in their only app screenshots. You can put a screen in there, you can put a text on top of it. Now the great thing about Android is that in one of the latest, like, I think, December, January, they allowed also to internationalize that. Why a lot of older apps didn't do that is because you couldn't internationalize the screenshots. So if you wanted to put text in there, you have to pick the language. Now you can put in one image for German, one Im image for English and so on. And 
I know it sounds very silly to talk about the app screenshot so much, but I really want to hammer the point home that this can like double your double your uh, user number because when the people convert, when they go to your app and they have an understanding of what it's about, you get a much better conversion. So it's really very, very critical. So use it, look at some of the simple tricks. First of all, localize the screenshot. So make the effort to make it in German, English, Spanish, whatever uh, languages you have. Then consider to add text on there, not only like your plain app screenshots, but write some fonts on it, what they see. Maybe use a video if you can, um, because that's really what it's all about. So look at a way that you, that you represent it in a way that it's very, very visual, and that's not like a screenshot of your app, because a screenshot of your app might be good for like some of the additional ones, but especially the screen number one and two, that people need to get what your app is about. They only scroll further to the screenshot what your app looks like if they are like convinced that it's worth their time. So consider that if somebody looks at it 10 seconds or even less, three seconds, do they have an idea what you're talking about? And they look at some of the best crossing games and you see excellent screenshots and look some of the big brands and some of the other apps and you see really shitty screenshots. So that's, that's, the, that's the point. And the second point, which I didn't represent here visually, but what's also fairly important you can also see is that you need to have really simple, high quality icons that the people can later on easily relate to. So it's very, very important. I think Mega Megapolis here doesn't necessarily have the best one because it's not as clear as it could be, but the other uh, ones, especially the Simpsons ones, obviously is a really good and simple one. Then the next one, yeah? I'll come to the description in a second. I think um, the description is uh, what, what, I, I've, um, what I've understood from most of the things which I read about it. The first one or two sentences are really critical. And then it's critical that you build it in a way that you can scan through that uh, very, very easily. Um, so that you basically, people scan through it and they're looking for keywords. And if you have one big blob of text, then they can scan through it very badly. So a nice description is like, um, I'll present more about that a bit later. Lockout, uh, Lockout Security has a really nice description because you, they have basically whatever you're looking for it. If you pan over it fast, you'll find it. Um, but I'll, I'll talk more about that. OK, then the next one. Mao is really your best friend, uh, obviously meaning mobile app store optimization and nothing else, because otherwise what you see from Coca-Cola behind happens to you. Um, you might not really see that very well on the screen, but as you see, the number one search for Coca-Cola uh, reports a Cola battery widget, which is from the user NKZ33, and not from the Coca-Cola Corporation, which is really shitty if you're like owning the Coca-Cola brand and people searching for your brand and they don't find your app on top, but some, uh, I don't know, some lone developer guy who doesn't even call his app Coca-Cola, but was obviously much smarter with the optimization of his content uh, than you are. Um, and again, you paid a lot of money for it. And the people downloading somebody else's app, then yeah, then you're bad, pretty much having a very bad agency, which should be fired. Um, and as an app developer, then you should kick yourself in the butt because you definitely should do better. Um, and then on the positive side, how it should be done, if you search, for example, for a highly competitive word like security, which there's a lot of apps on Android because we know all about the yeah malware and stuff like that. So on Android, clearly there's a lot of apps who want to own that space because it's a big market. And then you see, for example, um, look out as the number one app in that very, very competitive area. It's important that you understand how the ranking in the, in the, in the, and what I mean with App Store, I mean always all of them. I talk about iOS, Android, Google Play, and all the other markets, so I don't differentiate. For me, it's all an App Store, even if Apple say they have a trademark on that, uh, I use it in the generic terms. So the idea is basically that you need to hammer your keywords in there and be that, do that very smart. You need to look at a couple of other factors, of course. They look also how much was your app downloaded, which you can impact with the other stuff, so it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have a lot of downloads, you're listed on top. If, you have a, if you're listed on top, you stay there and so on. So this you cannot really easily impact. Your ratings are very critical. I'll talk about that in a second. So if your users think your app is shit, then Google ranks it much lower in the search result list. So Obviously, they have also a very good rating with, uh, with four and a half stars, but they're not the only one. But then what they did is they made sure that wherever they have the top two keywords, they're all everywhere. They are in the app name, so they don't call the app only uh, Lookout. They call their Lookout Security and Antivirus. And you can see, like, I underlined how heavily they use keywords in the app description. And they're not yet using it once, but they're using it very heavily. They're using, like, keywords in all kinds of 
variations. So they use protection viruses, security, antivirus, and then they use them also combined because when they're closer together, they're higher ranking in search engines, antivirus protection, and so on. And um, they use them in a, in a good density. So this is basically what you know from basic search engine optimization technologies. So that's, that's um, a critical thing. And then what they do, it very smart at the end, they just put a section with all the keywords. If you say they put a keyword, they put antivirus, antivirus with a dash, backup, and so on and so on. So I mean, this is basically bullshit. When you read through the app description, you think, why are they using, putting um, keywords in there? But it's very important, because if I use search for any combination, I always find the app on top. And they're doing fantastic. I mean, they're making a lot of a lot of money and a lot of downloads with that. Um, and that's basically, I mean, I don't know. It's not a very common known brand. And they're number one, and they're getting probably now more than than, than Norton Security or Kaspersky or whatever. So, and that's by app store optimization, and that's that's really critical. So, look about that. It, I mean, everybody who uses their app name and thinks they have like a magic brand or so on, you can use your brand. It's fantastic, but I mean, add something to it. I mean, for example, when we're launching our next app, it will be a navigation, the onboard navigation, and we'll basically call it GPS navigation. I mean, what, what the fuck? I mean, our brand and company name, it doesn't matter. And as you see, Lookout was also so smart, they even put it in their company name. Of course, it's a bit late if you already have a company to change your company name that it contains a keyword. But I mean, this is a very competitive market. So look at it this way. This way. Um, then the next thing is obviously only really um, appropriate if you have a paid app or if you have paid in-app purchases. So if you only want to make your money with, uh, with uh, in-app purchase, uh, with, with the advertisement, then that's not really relevant. But if you want to make money from the user paying you, then look at price promotions. I, I mean, unfortunately, users really think when you put a 60% discount on them, they're making a great deal. They have no idea what's the reference. I mean, I can say my app is worth 100 euro and you get a 60% discount, you can get it for 40 euro. Probably much more users will buy this app when I say my price is 10 euros. Because then they feel it's expensive if they have 60% discount of an app and it's still more expensive than, whoa, they are very smart, certainly, because they're saving a lot of money. They're saving 60, 70%. And they can buy their girlfriend lunch with that next time when they go out because they saved so much. So I mean, this is really how users think. And uh, just to give you some, uh, some data, you can look that up from Distimo. They looked at the revenue effect of putting an app on sale. And as you can see, that overall, the Android users are the cheapest. Because you see on the left side the iPad and the iPhone users. And the impact over the, over the overall uh, period is uh, on Android it's plus 29% more revenue if you if you make a sale. So and this also looks at things like before and after the periods. So it's clearly very well established that people make much more money when they put their apps on promotions. So I mean you make more sales during the promotion, but you also make more revenue afterwards because you have a higher chart position usually. Uh, you have more people who spread the word for you. So if you have something paid, then really consider doing some forms of promotion. It can work for in-app purchases as well. So that's really important. And you look at the games. I mean, if you look at, um, at Real Racing 3, for example, they, they combine that very cleverly with, uh, with push messages. And they also see which user is paying what. So you don't give a user promotion who pays you anyway. Somebody who's buying in-app purchases all the time, you don't need to give them promotion. But if they just use your app but don't pay you, then it might be worth in giving them a promotion. So if you use promotions cleverly, it's a fantastic way of making more, more money. And then again, back to the, to the App Store optimization. So, I mean, really be blunt about asking your users for reviews. Because basically, you de definitely get the reviews from angry users anyway. So if your app crashes, if your app doesn't work well, you'll get their one-star reviews if you want it or not. So why not tell the users who are actually in your app and who seem to be happy because they're using them uh, to rate it? So this is like on the one side, you see what, what we're doing in our next app. So basically, when somebody starts the app five times, we assume that you think it doesn't really suck that much because hopefully you wouldn't open it five times. Um, and if he opens it five times, you ask him, hey, please help us. I mean, you're using our app and you want that more people have it. We pay more for development and so on. So please give it a five star rating and then just press one button. You're in the Google Play page from us and you can easily do a rating. That helps. I mean, when we, um, I, I cannot give you the Android numbers, but when we integrated that on iOS, it immediately improved our rating by half a star. So now we're at four and a half star rating on iOS. I was just by integrating this one. One or two developer days give you half a star better rating, give you better app store positions, more co download conversions and so on. So everybody who doesn't do that is really wasting a lot of time and money. And another thing which you can see 
here is also consider giving your users something for sharing, right? So if you have like some form of in-app currency or in-app purchases, basically say to them, hey, if you share it on Twitter, if you, sh if you like us on Facebook, or if you send an email to a friend, you'll get this in-app feature for free, you'll get some coins, whatever. Works very, very well. And I mean, promotion is worth a lot, so why not compensating your users instead of some stupid ad platform, right? So that's, uh, that's a nice thing. And then one thing which we also learned about Android, especially, and which you can read also in all of the studies, basically, Android is a platform where free base version is a must. Uh, although Android has the most easy policy that you can return an app within 15 minutes and get your money back, if you don't offer something for free on Android, you're doomed to fail on, 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 the, on the Android platform. I mean, I've not seen examples of people who have only a paid app. It might be there's different versions. I'm not saying you need to go freemium. But you should at least have the ability to give a trial or whatever, anything. But on Android, if the users, they're very different from, from iOS or other users. So really consider what you can give them for free. You can give them a two-week version to test it out. You can give them a light version, whatever. But if you don't have something for free, then, well, you'll fail. We've seen that, so I can definitely attest to that. Um, as you see also from the numbers, this is, uh, this is not absolute numbers, but index numbers, which I could find. I could unfortunately not find really much, much better numbers. But from here you see that like 80% of the revenues are made from freemium app and 20% from premium apps. And this doesn't figure in that a big part of the premium apps, they still have like trial or light versions. They're not exactly freemium. But you can see that probably with this, if you take the numbers together, I would say that 90-95% of the apps that make money on the platform, they have some sort of free component. Then another very nice thing to do is use push notifications to increase your retention. So again, real racing, unfortunately I didn't have the, the screenshot for here, but real racing when I used the app and I didn't use it, and then after pretty much like middle of the next day, so like I think like 16, 20 hours after I didn't use the app, they sent on my Android phone push notification was coming, uh, hey, you can get now in-app purchases for 40% off. And then I, I killed that and just to see, reinstalled it if that comes every time or just like a, the dedicated time or just really another time. I uninstalled it, installed it again and then basically after I used it and didn't use it anymore, exactly the same thing. So if you look at games, they have very exact periods when they know if you're very active, they don't need to retain you. But the best way to retain somebody is not maybe an hour after he played it because he might be bored by it, but at a period like maybe a day later when he's like interested to come back to your app. And this push notifications can be anything from um, can be anything from, hey, look at our app again, see there's a new thing or there's a new update coming. It can be a discount, which you can combine with the other things. So consider what's a good interval to get your users back again and retain them that they're not forgetting about your app. Um, so that's like, especially on Android, it's a great way to keep yourself noticed. Um, then another very important thing, in my opinion, is use country-based pricing. I mean, I'm always like, I don't know why some apps on Android cost 87 cents. I mean, this doesn't make a sen uh, any difference because, I mean, clearly very long established research and pricing shows that the people cannot, like, if you charge them 87 cents, you might as well charge them 95 cents. So you're w either you're wasting money and you're making it look very weird for them. I mean, this is basically extremely simple to increase your revenue. It's just a few percent, so you're not making like tons of additional money with it. But if you make nice prices for all the currents, uh, for all the markets, <coughs> excuse me, that will help you a lot. So just consider if you have paid apps or in-app purchases, price them per market, and also consider the purchasing power for a market. So maybe you might want to offer it cheaper in Russia than in Germany. Um, or maybe people in Russia are buying your app are so rich that you want to price it twice as expensive. I don't know. So look at the markets and discriminate. I mean, that's very, very simple. Look at what the people pay and take their money because they obviously want to give it to you. Um, and then another thing is also localize your app, right? I mean, a lot of people here assume that English is so well known because they and all their developer friends speak English that they mean the whole world speaks English. But if you look at reality, if you look at China, Russia and so on, then not everybody might speak very well English. So I've, uh, I've talked with a, uh, with a game developer and they have, once they have localized the app to Russian, they've seen a 10x increase in revenue, which was from a not too small basis. So when you make 10x as much money in Russia, of course not in all the markets, just by localizing it, that's worth a lot. In China, it's more complicated. It's not only about translating it because you need to also translate to the like cultural things. So they're just if you have the text in Chinese, doesn't necessarily mean that your app applies to the market. But at least for the 
for the Western markets, definitely translating your app to those languages helps. So look at that you get your app at least into the major languages translated. If you don't want to pay for yourself by that, just ask your community to help you. Facebook has shown us how that works and so on. Obviously it only works if you have a good amount of users, but that's really like very, very simple. And then the last one, um, I'm a bit reluctant to put that in there because I think really these things very much suck and I hope that no developer will do that. But I know also from a lot of people who have spoken that they make a lot of money with it. So I think in terms of being fair and transparent, I'll share these hints. Also, I hope that please, if any of you do that, give, a, give me a premium version that I can pay for and I don't like these kind of ads. But what works really, really well in terms of monetization, much better than normal ad platforms from the people I've spoken with, is either interstitial ads. So while you're loading some content, you show like an ad, an ad uh, because the other people are really attend to it. Um, then incentivized downloads work well. The incentivized downloads I find okay because if the people say I'll get some in-app currency for downloading some other apps, I can choose if I want to do that or not. So that's, that's I think, fair game. Um, and the other one is uh, exit ads. So you get a push, ma push message when you leave the ad. Hey, don't you want to have this or that, whatever. Um, or also um, the ability once you install the app, a small pop-up which says, do you not want to download the search bar from XYZ, whatever. Um, you can find all the details there from VServe, MadApps, Startup, which has just uh, presented this, I know, and AirPush. So you'll find a lot of these stuff. So in case you have a free only app and you really like need some hack to get some money out of it because all the traditional ad stuff don't work and paying apps is also not really feasible for you, then do that. I'm personally a fan of paying people for their work because then they work for me and not somebody else. So I think I'd rather much pay a developer $4.99 for using his app than having some crazy ads which take all my data and so on. That's why I personally wouldn't put that in my apps, but I know that's um, very good. Um, from a monetization perspective. And then also a last slide about warning. So don't follow the dark side, which means don't do fake downloads because they will catch you eventually. You'll get like, what the people do is that you find a lot of companies who offer you that they grade for you one million Google Play accounts. They all download your app, rate you with five stars. Um, but then probably all of these downloads come somewhere from China. Thank you very much.